All right, so in the last sections of chapter three, what we're going to be doing is using all the differentiation rules that we've learned and learning how to apply them. So in 3.7, we're going to be thinking about the derivative as rates of change. <clears throat> so the first thing is that if you're given a position function, and let's call it s of t, then the velocity can be modeled by, so if s of t tells us where a function is, the velocity is going to tell us where it's going. Okay, And the way we can find that So the way we can find that is by taking the derivative. So the derivative of the position function is going to give us the velocity, which is distance over time. Okay, now the speed can be modeled by, so if the velocity has a direction, right? So velocity is positive if you're moving away from something and negative if you're moving towards something. So if the distance is getting greater, it's positive. If the distance is getting smaller, it's negative. So speed is just going to be the absolute value of the derivative or the absolute value of the velocity function. Now acceleration, that means how um, is your velocity changing? That's going to be the second derivative of our position function or the first derivative of our velocity function, which is going to be how your distance change over time squared. Okay. What made this pretty famous um, is Galileo's formula, which says you can determine the height of an object at time t if you have these four things. The first thing is h naught. That's its initial height. V naught, what that is, is that's the object's initial velocity. T is going to be time. And G, well, what goes up must come down, so that is gravity. Okay, now here's the thing about gravity is when we measure it, you're either going to be measuring it in meters, so 9.8 meters per second squared, or you're going to be measuring it in feet, which is 32 feet per second squared. Okay, so here's the deal, is if I am on top of a building and I throw a ball, what's going to happen is I'm going to throw that ball up in the air, it's going to slow down then, as it comes back towards the Earth, it's going to speed up. Okay, so that is the initial height, the initial velocity, time, and then how gravity affects it. So let's look at a couple examples. So let's say that a stone was tossed upward with a velocity of 64 feet per second and is thrown from a window 20 feet above the ground. Okay, so really quick, we're looking at measuring this in feet. So our gravity is going to be this guy. So if I want to find the height of the stone after two seconds, I'm going to have to use Galileo's formula, which says that the height after time t is going to be its initial height, which is 20 feet, plus its initial velocity, which was 64 times t, minus one half times the gravity. Remember, we're measuring this in feet, so our gravity is going to have to be 32 t squared. So if I want to find the height after 2 seconds, I'm going to have to plug 2 into my height function. So that would be 20 plus 64 times 2 minus 1 half times 32 is going to give us 16 times 2 squared. So my height after 2 seconds is going to be the next question is asking what is the velocity of the stone? Well, height is a position. So if I want to figure out the velocity, I need to take the derivative of this height function. So h prime of t, which will give me my velocity function, will equal, so the derivative of 20 is just 0. 
The derivative of 64t is going to be 64. And the derivative of 1 half 32t squared, well, that 2 is going to come down in front and cancel out with that 1 half, so that's going to be minus 32t. Now, if I want to know the velocity after 3 seconds, I'm going to have to plug 3 in. So h prime of 3, which is the same thing as plugging 3 into my velocity function, because they are the same thing, would be 64 minus 32 times 3, which would give me... negative 32 feet per second. So what does it mean to have a negative velocity after I've thrown the stone? Well, here's what that means. If I'm 20 feet above the ground, okay, and I throw a stone, like so, what's happening is that the distance between the stone and the ground is increasing on this left-hand side but then decreasing on this right-hand side. So this negative 32 feet per second, that would, be when the, um, that would be when the stone is returning back to Earth and not when it's leaving my hand going upward. Okay. Now the next question is, what time is the rock at its highest? And we want to find the highest point of the stone. Now if we look back up at this picture, notice that the rock is going to be at its highest at this vertex of this parabola. So also at this vertex, the tangent line is equal to zero. So in order to find when the rock is at the highest, we want to find when its velocity is zero. So that means when its velocity changes from being positive, so going up, to being negative, going down. So when the velocity equals zero. So we're going to have zero equals 64 minus 32t. When we solve for t, we're going to have that t is going to be 2 seconds. So 2 seconds after that rock is thrown, it's going to be at its highest. Now the next question is it said find the highest point of the stone. Well if we want to find height, we're not going to use the velocity function. We're going to go back up here and we're going to use that height function. So the height after 2 seconds is going to be well, we already found it actually in the first one. After two seconds, it's going to be 84 feet high. Wonderful. Now, the next example. <clears throat> so suppose the cost of creating a gadget is given by this function, where x is the number of items and c of x is the cost of creating the product. What we want to do is determine the marginal cost function and what the marginal cost is when x equals 5,000. So here's the deal, is that marginal cost is how much it costs to create the next item. So if you're familiar with economics, the more items you create, the cheaper it is to create each item, right? So if you just wanted to make like one cupcake, right? You would have such a huge overhead that it wouldn't be worth the business. But if you wanted to make a thousand cupcakes, then you could buy things in bulk, you could sell them for cheaper, right? You'd make more money. So the marginal cost function, which we typically call mc of x, is the derivative of the cost function. What that means is it's going to be the cost per item. Now the reason the derivative gives us that rate of change is because it's always going to tell us how our y is changing with respect to our x. So let's go ahead and find the derivative of this guy. So the derivative of 1.25 million is just 0. This piece here, remember, we can rewrite that as 125 million times x to the negative first power. So that's going to be negative. 125 million x to the negative second, because you have to subtract 1 from the exponent, plus, and the derivative of this is just 1.5. Now, it asks us to find the marginal cost when x was 5,000, so we're going to have to plug 5,000 into here. 
And when we do, we are going to get, isn't into this, here's what we are going to get. We are going to get negative 3.5. What that means in terms of the um, <coughs> context of the problem is that we are losing, nope, not losing. What that means in the context of the problem is that it's going to cost us negative $3.5 for each item produced after the 5,000th item is produced or gadget. So the next question is going to do with population growth of the United States. So suppose that we can measure the population of the United States in millions t years after 1900. Okay? The graph of the derivative is shown below. So this is not the graph of the original function, it's the derivative. Now, a couple things I want to do before I even jump into this, okay, is that this is 20 years after 1900, so that would be the year 1920. Okay? The next thing I'd like to point out is that this is the derivative. So what that's doing is that it's telling you the rate at which the population is changing. So for example, at the time 1960, okay, let's say that that's about, oh, let's say that's like 2.8. How we would interpret this is that in 1960, the population was growing by 2.8, how is that measured again? Millions per year. Okay. So let's go ahead and use this graph to answer some questions. Approximately when was the United States population growing the most slowly between 1900 and 1990? So what we want to find is that we want to find the lowest point on this graph. So if I look about right here, it looks like in 1930, the population was growing, was at its lowest, and it looks like it was a little bit above 1 million, so I would say like 1.2 million. And again, that's per year. Can you guys think of anything that happened in the 30s that would cause population growth to decline so rapidly? Yep, Great Depression, good job. So approximately when, in what year, was the US population growing the most rapidly between 1900 and 1990? So what we see here is that our derivative reaches a peak right here, so in 1960. So in 1960, when there's a lot of free love going around, our population growth was the highest at 2.8-ish million people being added every year. Now, it says in what year, if any, was the population decreasing? So not the derivative. Was there ever a year where the population actually decreased? So remember, the population would decrease if our derivative was negative or less than zero. Okay, so what this graph means is that because all of these values are positive, that means even though the rate of change might have slowed down or sped up, we were constantly adding people, right? That means that the overall population never declined, it just might have slowed down. So in what year? In the year never. Okay. Now, in what years was the population growth rate increasing? Okay, so when was the growth rate increasing? So now is the time where we want to look. So we look like we have an increase here between these years and also here between 1930, 1960 and between 1918 or 1918, 1980 to about 1990. Looks like that is when the population growth itself started to increase. Okay, so let's go ahead and 
I'm just going to write these two down because they're a little bit clearer. So 1930 to 1960 and 1980 to 1990. Alright, we have one more example which is one of my favorites. So, in a fish farm, okay, a population of fish is introduced into a pong, pond <laughs> and harvested regularly. A model for the rate of change of the fish population is given by this. Okay, So we have that the population, which is P, is going to change with respect to time given R0 times 1 minus P of T divided by PC <clears throat> times P of T all minus beta P of T. Now this looks pretty overwhelming, but we're going to get um, all of those variables given to us. So first off, we have to know the rate at which the fish are giving birth, right? At what rate are they repopulating? The other thing that we need to know is that we need to know P sub C. What that is, is that's the maximum population that the pond can sustain. That's called the carrying capacity. Okay. And last but not least, we have to know at what rate are we harvesting these fish, okay? So beta is going to be the percentage of the population that's harvested. All right, so what value of the derivative would correspond to a stable population? So here's the thing. If the derivative is positive, that means greater than zero, that means that our population is increasing. If our derivative is less than zero, that means the population is decreasing. So what's the only number we're left with to get a stable population? Well, if the change in the population is zero, that means that we have no change. That means that we're probably harvesting the fish as fast as they're giving birth. So every fish that we take out is being replaced by a new fish. Okay. Now, if the pond can sustain 10,000 fish and the birth rate is 5% and the harvesting rate is 4%, we want to find the stable population level. Okay. So let's go ahead and just enter in all the information that we know. So we know that we're going to have a stable population when the derivative equals zero. So we're going to have zero equals, the birth rate is 5%, so we're going to put 0 0.05 for our r times 1 minus p of t divided by, now pc that is the carrying capacity, so that's going to be 10,000, times p of t, that's the thing we're trying to solve for, minus, our harvesting rate is 4%, so 0 0.04, times P of T. All right, so let's go ahead and expand this out and solve it. So we're going to have 0 equals, so if I take 0 0.05 and I factor that through, I'm going to have 0 0.05 minus 0.05 p of t divided by 10,000, remember that's all times p of t again, minus 0.04 p of t. Now I have to take this p of t and I have to factor it through. So this is going to give me 0 equals 0.05 p of t minus 0.05 divided by 10,000 I have a p of t here and a p of t here, so when I multiply them, I'm going to get p of t squared minus 0 0.04 p of t. Now this might look scary, but remember, this is p of t and this is p of t, so I can put those guys together. So that will give me 0 equals 0 0.01 p of t minus 0 0.05 divided by 10,000 of t squared. And now to solve this, what I need to do is factor out a p of t, 
We're just treating p of t like it's a variable. All right, now this is only going to have two solutions, right? Now this is going to have a solution when either p of t equals zero. Well, we don't want our population to equal zero. That makes no sense. Or when this piece equals zero, so 0 0.01 minus 0 0.05 divided by 10,000 times p of t equals zero. So what we're going to do is that we're going to take this piece and we're going to go ahead and solve it for p of t. So subtract that 0 0.01 from both sides. So we're going to have negative 0 0.05 over 10,000 p of t equals negative 0 0.01. And then we're going to multiply both sides by 10,000 divided by 0 0.05. So we're going to have p of t equals negative 0 0.01 times negative 10,000 divided by 0 0.05. So our population is going to stabilize in growth when p equals 2,000. All right, so just as a review, what we just did <coughs> is we took all of these variables, okay? We plugged them in to that population growth right here. Remember, we want a stable population level, so we want our derivative to be equal to zero. After that, the whole rest of this was just algebra. So what we did is that we treated this p of t right here like it was a variable. So we expanded it out, simplified it, factored it, solved it, and we got that we're going to have a stable population when p of t equals 2,000. Now the next question is what happens if beta is raised to 5%? All right, so if we raise beta, our harvesting rate, from 4% to 5%, given all this information above, what is going to happen? So let's take a look at what happens. So if we raise beta to 5%, so the question, the next question is what happens if our harvesting rate is raised to 5% given all the previous stuff. So we're going to have the change in the population over time is going to equal, so <clears throat> if we plug all of those variables in that we had in part B, so we have 10,000 fish for our carrying capacity, 5 for our birth rate, but now we have 5 for our harvesting rate, what's going to happen? So here's what is going to happen. If we plug all those numbers in, I'm going to go ahead and start from here, and the only number I have to change is this one right here. So I just need to change that 0.04 to a 0.05. So we're going to have 0.05 times our population minus 0.05 over 10,000 times our population squared minus 0.05 times our population. Now what's going to happen is that the harvesting rate is going to cancel out with our birth rate. So the change in our population is going to be negative 0.05 divided by 10,000 times p of t squared. Now, here's what this means in context. Note that our population always needs to be positive. You can't have negative fish. So if you have a positive number times a negative number, what that means is that you are going to have a negative dp over dt. And what that means is that your population overall will decrease. Isn't that crazy that you can harvest at the same rate at which something is being born, but your population will still decrease? The reason is, is because populations are this really dynamic thing. Like it doesn't just matter that you are um, 
harvesting fish that are born, you also have to think of all the fish that die in between, right? In the interim, like the ones that don't make it, the ones that don't survive, the ones that um, maybe are infertile, right? So you can't just harvest at the same rate at which they're being born. Ugh, so cool.